the short stature stand in height more than two standard deviation or more below the mean for children of that particular sex and for the chronological age we define it as a short stature so, but if it is uh, more than three standard deviation definitely it's a um, it's some pathological problem is there and but for the definition we consider it has a less than two standard deviation or more below the mean usually in our growth charts we don't we usually have the lowest uh, centile is a third centile we usually say uh, uh, two standard deviation means a less than the third centile but in real speaking it is not the third most books and the article says it is 2.5 centile and some article says it is 2.3 centile but as the growth charts uh, in our setup, we have the third centile. We usually consider for our easy workup, we say less than third centile is defined as a short stature. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend using the WHO growth charts for children less than two years and uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention charts for, the mo for more than two years. So what does it mean? Now we are quite familiar with this type of a charts in our CHDR, that is the World Health Organization chart. And usually they recommend, this is more compatible to use, uh, appropriate to use for the children from birth to two years. So this is a graph for the length for age for boys. And what is the CDC chart? The Center for Disease Control and the Prevention. And this is for a girl girls chart it is from uh, two years of age to 20 years of age so usually uh, most of our setup in our clinic setup ward setup we usually use a cdc chart because most of the children we investigate for short stature are not not less than two years of age most of them are about two years of age so we use the cdc chart for our uh, references the first step in the evaluation of a child with a short stature is to obtain accurate measurements and plot them on the appropriate growth chart. Now, in our setup, usually the less than two year we measured using a horizontal rule and children above less than about two years, we use a stadiometer to get their accurate height. Now, all of can see this, the stadiometer, but we use Anyway, there are certain uh, rules that we follow uh, to measure the correct height of the patient. And now we need to get the correct height and we need to plot it on the chart, on the chart and see where it is 10. So if it is less than three standard deviation, we categorize it as a short stature. In those cases, we need to see whether it is actually short or B, it is just a normal variant. For that particular judgment, we have to get the mid-parental height and to judge the projected height of that particular child. Now, how do you get the mid-parental height calculation? It is an important part of the workup, the clinicians, because most of the short children, they are not really short because they are short parents, children of short parents. So we don't have to investigate or we don't have to work up or we don't have to start any treatment because they are just short children of a short parents. Now for the girl, when you calculate the mid parental height, you deduct 13 centimeter and get the average. And for the boys, we add 13 centimeter and get the average. So that is the way you calculate the mid-parental height. Now, then it comes to the projected height. It can, can be estimated by projecting the current growth curve to the adulthood. Now, you saw the CDC chart earlier. Now, usually it's, it has from 2 to 20 years of age. So now you get the mid-parental height at that adult age level and you get the mid-parental range. So what is this mid-parental range is from the mid-parental height plus or minus 10 centimeter. 
Now you get them in parental rage, and then you have their child's value, and you just see that whether your profitable value of that particular child falls within that plus or minus ten centimeter range. Now, if the projected height just falls within the plus or minus ten centimeter or the two standard deviation of their mid parental height. Suggests that they will catch up their growth in future when they become adults. But provided all other factors like especially the bone age is normal, right? But if the projected height differs from the mid parental height by more than ten centimeter, it suggests there is a pathological condition and that. child needs to be work up for the short stature to find out the etiology for that particular child now before i am uh, just move over to my etiological factors and all those things and i would like to highlight growth velocity what is growth velocity we need two measurements within the one plot or one measurement is very difficult to say whether this child is growing or not we have to measure the growth velocity to velocity we need two measurements at least 3 to 6 months apart preferably 6 to 12 months apart that is to determine the growth velocity of the child now if you look at this chart it shows the growth velocity of the children and when it comes to the birth to 12 months just see the how fast they grow 23 to 27 cm and from 12 months to 1 year it is less than that now when it slowly comes over to 5 years to puberty you can see that growth velocity is deducting but when it comes to the pubertal growth spurt again it rises up it boosts up right so now velocity just slowly slowly deducting and all of a sudden at the level of the puberty or the growth spurt it goes up Right. Now, just important part in this lecture. I just as clinician, we need to understand the biology of the linear growth. Now, the so why the people become short, and the, there are so many etiological factors, and how these etiological factors contribute to uh, the children to be short in those in those lines. The the indoor physiological. Hello, hello. Are you listening? Yeah, yeah. You are audible, madam. But we got some outside disturbance. I just muted them. Okay, okay. Sorry, it's not from my side. Thank you, Dinesh. The right, right. Now, as the emerging evidence reveals that. normal and pathological variations in linear growth depends on the balance between the proliferation and the maturation of the chondrocytes at the growth plane two factors proliferation as well as the maturation of the chondrocytes at the growth plane now how does this process regulate now most important factor is the endocrine mechanism now if i further elaborate this growth hormone insulin like growth factor 1 androgens and thyroid hormone stimulate the chondrogenesis now that's why when there are is a deficiency of the growth hormone igf1 or androgen or thyroid and the people won't grow there will be an uh, impaired linear growth of that particular children now glucocorticoids what it does it inhibits chondrogenesis that's why cushing syndrome they are short because inhibit chondrogenesis and the estrogen promote linear growth by stimulating the growth hormone and the insulin like growth factor one secretion accelerate the maturation of chondrocytes but later on it leads to fusion of the growth plate and cessation of the linear growth so estrogen itself at the beginning it promotes accelerate the maturation but ultimately it helps to fuse the growth plate and cessation of the linear growth 
right i will explain that what happens in this excess estrogen and why the um, ultimate they are short but at the beginning when compare with the peers they are tall and then pro inflammatory cytokines and they are negatively regulates the growth plate function this nicely described and we all know the chronic disorders like renal disorder uh, inflammatory bowel disorders chronic asthma congenital heart disorder liver disorder they won't grow as normal their linear growth is retarded the reason is the pro inflammatory cytokines are more in those chronic inflammatory disorder and they negatively regulates the growth plate function and paracrine mechanism and the, that is a third mechanism now first i explain the endocrine mechanisms then i explain the pro inflammatory cytokines and then the paracrine mechanisms they are the fibroblast growth factor bone morphogenic proteins and parathyroid hormones if there is an imbalance of these fibroblast growth factor parathyroid hormone or any morphogenetic proteins they also tend to be short so nicely explain me osteogenesis imperfect i chondroplasia and those uh, bone problems and uh, so now in those patients why they are short because this is the mechanism operating in those patients and the cartilage extracellular matrix again the same skeletal dysplasia yes? collagen proteoglycans and other bone proteins if there is an imbalance of those proteins they also tend to be short and then the other one this is just hopefully a new developing field intracellular pathways and you and me most of the time have come across we investigate children for a short stature but they don't have any reason like they don't have any reason we just do the endocrine assessment normal and they probably have the bone age is also normal and no chronic disorders as such and but we just trying to investigate for a etiology but we cannot identify any etiological factors for those patients they are the patients who are having problems of the intracellular pathway what is this intracellular pathways they are the actually the transcription protein of the cell right now when we get the signal to the cell membrane it does that signal pass over to the nucleus but in between that message transport there are so many proteins are operating now if there are any genetic abnormality of those transcription protein because of the genetic abnormality so that transcription won't happen effectively so they are tend they tend to short now most of our as pediatrician would have come across this type of a situation in the past we investigate but no cause found they are short but could be this problems of the intracellular pathways it is very interesting shocks that is short stature homeopox x socks gene and the mapk there are different names for those mitogen activated protein kinase signaling pathway so if any abnormality and they tend to be short i will just elaborate little bit on about this intracellular pathways during the latter part of my lecture now then we'll move over to normal variants of growth there are four types of normal variant of growth identified familial or genetic short stature constitutional delay idiopathic short stature and small for gestational age babies who catch up their growth later on now we will just take one by one out of these four the number one we all familiar with this familial or genetic short stature most often is a normal variant now they have a low normal height velocity throughout the life bone age is consistent with the chronological age now they are 10 years of age less than two standard deviation they are high but if you do the bone age it is also 10 years so no delay in bone age consistent with the chronological age now in those particular patient if you actually get the mid parental range 
this projected height of this particular child falls within the mid parental range so they are fami familial short stature or a genetic short stature now second entity constitutional delay of growth and puberty cdgp this is the actually in day to day life in our practice we work for the short stature but most of our children ended up being the constitutional delay of growth and puberty they are childhood short stature but relatively normal adult height they are normal size at birth the babies having the normal birth weight but we witness the downward shift in the growth rate usually around 3 to 6 months this can happen even in the normal babies who are not short later on but the cdgp they shows a slightly flat not flattening of their growth linear growth at the age of 3 to 6 months but it can happen in the normal babies but they catch up in pretty quickly but in this cdgp it is more severe and prolonged if somebody with the normal without a cdgp catch up might be catch up at the age of 6 or 7 years but they usually catch up towards the puberty 12 to 14 years of age in addition to the low height velocity they tend to have delayed puberty as well then you inquire the patient and usually most of them have in the family history mother or the father might say doctor we all would have had the same similar situation with our parents told us and i also had very short at the beginning but when i was in grade 8 or 9 i was more or less equal to my friends so this leads to marked discrepancy during the early teenage years compared with peers but they catch up growth and the puberty later on so in the grade 5 6 7 they are shorter than they are peers but when it comes to the a level classes and they are completely normal with their peers the whole mark of cdgp is the delayed skeletal age but it is not very marked delay skeletal age it is closely related to height age rather than the chronological age what is this height age now suppose now there is a 10 year old child whose weight falls below 2 waist now we get that point horizontally when it meets the 50th centile right and at the 50th when when that line meets at the 50th centile we get the appropriate age for that particular point now suppose 10 year old child having the height age of 8 years right and their skeletal age is so the bone age is also going to be 8 years now suppose when you plot your growth chart you get the point the height of the patient you draw a horizontal line parallel to your x axis till you meet the 50th centile and you get the age for that particular point and your bone age also falls within that age so height age and the bone age is equal not with the chronological age as the bone age is delayed the growth continues longer than normal resulting in adult stature within the normal range there will be a history of growth delay in one or both parents you call the mesolate boomers now this is nice graph the explaining the normal variant of growth linear growth and the constitutional delay if you take this is the darker line and just see it is flattening towards here here and then they catch up the growth and when it comes to the normal 50th centile in the adult range but the familial short stature they tend to be parallel to the two waist lines and they are short even at the adults so compare compare in the constitutional delay and the familial short stature now the third category of the common normal variant of the short stature idiopathic short stature now this is the one that i explained you early idiopathic short stature we try to find out the cause no endocrine metabolic skeletal gene means genetic syndrome or any other diagnosis but it is a genetic variations and shock gene short stature homeobox a uh, majority of them uh, with the responsible gene is the shock gene 
Now, what is this variation of the SHOX shocks gene is? Now, it's actually explained by the epigenetic. I am not a good, um, having a good knowledge of the genetics, but just can understand the uh, principles or the basics behind the epigenetic changes. Now, these epigenetic changes uh, increase methylation of the promoter region of, for the IGF gene. So, they are normal IGF gene, IGF-1 gene is little bit changed now because of the methylation process. Now what happened, because of these epigenetic changes and these IGF-1 does not have the normal sensitivity towards the growth hormone. So you have a normal growth hormone. Sometimes you may have a normal IGF level. That's why we investigate, we investigate and cannot find a cause. Normal IGF level, but the IGF sensitivity is not there because of the epigenetic changes of that particular shock gene. You called it the shock gene variant. Now, idiopathic short stature, there is no way of diagnosis other than these genetic variants because usually we came to the diagnosis by exclusion of other pathological causes of the child. The child's height percentile is below the range predicted by the mid-parental height, but very important, the bone age is not delayed. No evidence of underlying genetic systemic or endocrine disorder and not even a familial short stature like the seed, uh, constitutional delay children, they will not catch up the growth during the adulthood. No other cause found, but bone age is normal, they are short. So this is ISS, idiopathic short stature. Now the last entity of the common variant of the short stature, small for gestational age infants who catch up their growth. Uh, usually the small babies, they catch up their growth by the age of two years. But it may be a little delayed if they are other than the SGA or IUGR if they born preterm. But if the IUGR or small for gestational age is more severe, they will not catch up the normal growth by the age of two years. So this is again the normal variant of short stature. Now, I'll just move over to the pathological causes of short stature. Now, among them, there are systemic disorders, endocrine disorders, genetic disorders, and skeletal dysplasia. Now, systemic disorders, this is the common cause that we come across in day-to-day -day life with the chronic disorders, they are short, right? Now, undernutrition is the number one. They are stunted with the chronic malnutrition. It can be due to the poor intake or maybe a component of an underlying systemic disorders that probably you can remember the pro-inflammatory cytokines can contribute as well as with these chronic disorders, they have a poor appetite, their absorption may be impeded or maybe like a congenital heart or they, their energy requirement is high. So we are not able to just uh, give the required demand of the patient. The patient is unable to take the required demand for the body. So they are short. right? And the glucocorticoid therapy, now you can remember, it inhibits the chondrogenesis. So those who nephrotic syndrome on steroid therapy or any uh, like uh, rheumato rheumatoid disorders who are in steroid therapy tend to be short rheumatoid disorder. So other than the treatment, they are collagen, fibroblast growth factor, they all contribute for the rheumatological disorder. And the gastrointestinal disorder, especially celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, tropical flu, they have an increased pro-inflammatory markers which leads inhibits the chondrogenesis at the growth plate. Chronic kidney disease, I will not explain in detail. There are so many contributing factors. Being the chronic disorder, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are high. Other than that, because of the vitamin D metabolism, there is an impact of this uh, renal, renal uh, the, the osteodystrophy, and that's probably contributing the vitamin D metabolism into this chronic renal disease. And the other chronic disorders or systemic disorders which impede the linear growth of a child, if you name them, 
malignancy, pulmonary diseases, cardiac diseases, immunological disorders, metabolic disorders, they all can contribute to stunting or impaired linear growth of a child. Now, that is systemic disorders, how they affect the linear growth and be in the short. And number two is the endocrine causes of short stature. What are the endocrine causes? Usually, these disorders are characterized by, not always, but usually they are short. But if you look at their weight for height, and it's, there is increase because they are short, but they are stubby. No, excessive weight for the height is there. And then they have a marked reduced height velocity as well as delayed bone age. Now, number one, Cushing syndrome, and I explained you early. And it can be either exogenous sources of glucocorticoids or endogenous causes of glucocorticoids. Now, exogenous sources of the glucocorticoids are much more common cause than the endogenous. So what is exogenous? Treatment for asthma, I probably do not agree with the asthma now because most of the children with the asthma, they don't get excess steroids because they are getting very low doses. And inflammatory bowel disorder, you know that how it affects and nephrotic and the systemic lupus erythematosus. And they all need steroids for their survival and they're going to be short. This is exogenous steroid. And endogenous steroids are either centrally ACTX secreting pituitary tumors and or could be at the level of the adrenal gland, right, adrenal adenomas or central or peripheral. And the unique features are Cushing syndrome, you all know, and they, are, uh, they have a uh, uh, stries, they have a moon face, they have a buffalo hump, and they have a very thin skin and uh, pink stries, and they all features are consistent with the Cushing syndrome. Now, what, is the, what are the other endocrine causes? Hypothyroidism and markedly delayed bone age. And you diagnose by measuring the TSH and the even the free thyroxine. And this allows to detect whether the hypothyroidism comes from the central level or the gland level, both primary and central. And then the growth hormone deficiency. And if this is congenital and complete, affected children present with the severe postnatal growth failure. Severe postnatal growth failure. And delayed bone age and very low growth hormone, insulin like growth factor one, and IGF binding protein three. IGF binding protein three is the transport protein of the IGF one. Now, how this growth hormone deficiency, just wanted to explain more about the growth hormone deficiency that can come with the pan hypopituitarism. So that means the whole pituitary gland is affected. So they all, the, and, the, and the child is just devoid of all hormones that are secreted by the pituitary, like uh, uh, FSHLH, prolactin, growth hormone, and CTH, and uh, oxytocin. They all hormones can be affected because of the pan hypopituitarism, ADH, they all. But this could be even isolated growth hormone deficiency. Right? And we have seen patients with the pan hypopituitarism, like a septo optic dysplasia, and even the isolated growth hormone deficiency. Now, additional findings for this pan hypopituitarism are they come in the newborn period with some other odd features like prolonged jaundice, hypoglycemic conversion. They can have the midline defects, like a micropenis, and uh, they can, can come with all those associated features, give us an idea or clue towards there is a pan hypopituitarism. And the acquired growth hormone deficiency can come with the tumors and or like a craniopharyngioma, especially. It blocks the pituitary gland, damage, erode the pituitary, and the trauma and even the irradiation. And then the other endocrine causes. Now I said about growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and, and, and Cushing syndrome. And now fourth one is the sexual precaution. Now increased secretion of the gonadal steroid 
that is estradiol from girls and the testosterone in boys leads to short stature there are two consequences from this increased secretion of the gonadal steroid number one is sexual precocity number two is accelerated epiphyseal development so with that we see a rapid growth of the child and the increased bone age but as i told you earlier height age is advanced compared with the chronological age but lags behind the markedly accelerated bone age what does it mean suppose now there is a 10 year old child with a sexual precocity height is about 50 years same time now if you get the real age of this patient if, if uh, to the uh, uh, height age if you plot the height age on the same time chart chronological age is 10 years height age could be 12 years but if you get the bone age that could be 50 years that's why i said with the sexual precocity at the early stage they are having the chronological age but more height age even a further more bone age of that patient but this is in the early stage but what will happen because of the steroids this gonadal steroid cause a accelerated epiphyseal development in the early stage with the sexual precocity but epiphyseal closure is early when compared to their normal peers so they st abruptly stop the linear growth of those patients so ultimately earlier the tall but the adults are short there are two types of sexual precocity that is gonadotropin dependent precocious puberty and that is that you call a true or central precocious puberty and that of course operates through the hypothalamic pituitary and the gonadal axis comes from the top so the whole marker advanced born age plus all secondary sexual characteristics are early in girls breast development axillary hair and uh, pubic hair and even the boys the testicular size is high with the other secondary sexual characteristics are early so this is gdpp gonadotropin dependent precocious but in contrast to that what is gonadotropin independent precocious that does not come from the central it is not through the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal start from lower level so that could be adrenal gland producing adrenal steroid hormones and or hcg producing tumors macuno albright and so that is one and theca cell tumors estrogen secreting tumors and leydig cell tumors they all cause gonadal trophin independent precocious puberty they come from the lower level not with the higher like a hypothalamic or pituitary axis the clinical manifestations are similar to those with the gonadotropin independent they have a accelerated epiphyseal uh, epiphyseal uh, function uh, maturity or uh, development and as well as a precocious puberty but except in certain cases there are maybe there may be uh, uh, some sexual maturation that of the opposite sex now like in congenital adrenal hyperplasia uh, if the girls having the androgen androgen secreting tumors from the adrenal glands and they are probably having the androgenic defense they are masculine and they have all features of a male like a opposite sex now when it comes to the genetic disorders very few like a turner syndrome you all know they are very short and uh, primary amenorrhea and uh, they are very short means if you plot the average adult height approximately not even a 10 it's a 20 cm shorter than the predicted mid parental height so you all know the features of turner syndrome and uh, i will probably not going to just do that those details and the shock gene variants on the x chromosome and this is the primary manifestation of those children are short stature but they look like turner but they are not real turners if you do the karyotype they have a xx karyotype right but they have the features similar to those like a short forearms and the lower legs and the mid lung deformity of the forearm cubitus valgus high arch palate and they are little 
muscular hypertrophy, little masculine, like for the short stature. These features are absent in idiopathic short stature with without shocks. And if the shocks is there, they are all having these features. But the idiopathic short stature without shock genetic variant, they don't have these features. Now, when I explain to you about the idiopathic short stature, I said no features, nothing. That is, you call the idiop entity of the idiopathic short stature. But in the shocks variant, they have those features. Now, I know that everybody just having a bit of a query about this. What is this made lung deformity of the forearm? And I will show you a picture of the made lung deformity. And so they hopefully having the uh, 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 distal third of the radius is maldeveloped. So they have a dislocation or a subluxation of the distal radial ulna uh, the joint. And they have an increased space here. Intarsial space is more. And this is shorter than the ulna. So ultimately, their hand is like this. And they have a little bit of an ulna deviation and some deformity at the wrist. So this is what you call the made lung deformity. And Prandevilly syndrome. They are short stature is common, but may not develop until late childhood. When the child fails to undergo pubertal growth spurt, then only we, they are going to be short because they don't have pubertal growth spurt. And with those, the treatment with growth hormone is effective. And the Nona syndrome, again, it's a similar to Turner, but autosomal dominant. Short stature, peripheral pulmonary stenosis, low Z cures, delayed speech, and the motor milestone. That is again can be treated effectively with growth hormone. And the silver Russell syndrome, these actually the Prada Willi and the Nuna, there are so many researchers they have done. They have tried with the growth hormone and they have shown a good response. Good means not a very effective, but in the certain level, they have shown a response. And when it comes to the silver Russell and they are very small babies with some dysmorphism and they are small IUGR and postnatal growth retardation is there. They have a characteristic faces, faces, triangular face, prominent forehead, downturned corners of the mouth, hemihypertrophy. And the growth hormone treatment is not that as effective as the Prada Willi and the Nona, but is partly effective. And when it comes to skeletal dysplasia, now, this is the last one, endocrine. We talk about the endocrine, we talk about the chronic disorder, we talk about the genetic syndrome and the skeletal dysplasia. And here the inherited defect in cartilage and bone development and the disproportionate short stature. These disorders should be suspected in a child presenting with the short stature with the bone abnormality. Sometimes it is quite interesting. Some article says that some of the patients you can't actually see physically some bone abnormality, but if you get the radiology only, sometimes you can actually witness the radiological abnormality of those particular bones. But achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, osteogenesis imperfecta, osteopetrosis, they all evident physically as well. Now you all know why these skeletal dysplasia they are short because of the fibroblast, extracellular matrix, they all contributing abnormal fibroblast growth factors, abnormal matrix proteins, morphogen, bone morphogenetic proteins, they all are contributing for this, being the short of these skeletal dysplasia. Now, just to summarize the workup of short stature, height more than two standard deviation below the mean for age, Growth velocity less than five centimeter to five centimeter per year, or less or less than two cent or more than two centimeter below the mid parental height, and you are just getting the history and the examination or like uh, any uh, basic investigations to do to find out whether they have any chronic disorders and gastrointestinal symptoms, endocrine symptoms. If yes, then you can probably just take it as a chronic disorders leading to short stature. And they don't have any of the features of those chronic disorders. If the patient is dysmorphic, yes, then you need to find out if it's proportionate short stature or no. If the proportionate, then evaluate for the genetic syndrome such as Down syndrome and the Turner. And 
and if not then evaluate for chondral dystrophy right but if the patient is not dysmorphic then is the important part what you need to work up here assess growth velocity projected height weight and bone age and growth velocity if it is more than 5 cm per year and the delayed bone age it is the cdh constitutional delay of growth and puberty and the growth velocity is more than 5 cm per year but normal bone age projected height consistent with the mid parental height it is a genetic storage data or a familial short data you don't have to do anything for these two cases constitutional or a familial short data growth velocity is less than 5 cm per year with the delayed bone age normal or increased weight weight for height is high excessive and consider endocrine disorder anyway i will add another line for this if everything is normal other than the growth velocity your bone age is normal you don't have any physical or dysmorphism or if any uh, other endocrine symptoms or chronic disorder you categorize it as iss idiopathic short stature right now when as pediatrician we need to refer this patient to the endocrinologist children with intrauterine growth retardation who do not catch up to the growth curve by 2 years of age height more than 3 standard deviation below the mean for age growth velocity less than 5 cm per year no onset of puberty at the particular age like a 14 years of age for boys and 13 for girls projected height with the mid parental height calculation if it is uh, more than 10 cm away from the mid parental height and bone age more than two standard deviation below the chronological age and diagnosis of any condition that approved for recombinant growth hormone therapy now quickly through the laboratory studies bone age you know the how to get the bone age serum level of growth hormone that is the next important part but we are stuck here because the growth hormone is secreted in a pulsatile manner intermittent peaks are greater with the exercise meals and deep sleep they are for measuring a single random serum glucose serum growth hormone is of no value but if you do this random growth hormone at any stage if it is a more than 10 mg per deciliter not exclude generally exclude growth hormone deficiency but if it is a low in immaterial it does not mean anything for us because it can be very low at any stages of a child could be really normal because it secretes in a pulsatile manner just in case we are very lucky if it comes as more than 10 mg per deciliter we don't have to consider about the growth hormone deficiency right now next is the serum level of insulin like growth factor 1 and the insulin like growth factor binding protein 3 these are the useful test except in pubertal patient and those with the brain tumors because they have a high level of those and poor nutrition associated with the low serum igm so just see the confounding factor for us because now if sometime with the short stature we just do the igf level because if they are under nutrition they can be even having a no low serum igf level we don't get the real real uh, uh, results of that particular patient's uh, uh, work up and but consider provocative test if other pituitary hormones are normal because if all pituitary hormones are low you know that it is a pan hypopituitarism but if it is a isolated growth hormone then you need to find out it's really a growth hormone is low then you have to do the provocative test that is growth hormone stimulation test usually more powerful stimulus is the hypoglycemia insulin induced hypoglycemia i don't think that most of our centers will not perform this because of the there is a great risk for the patients and but alternatively as a secretor bogus of the growth hormone we can use arginine clonidine levodopa propanolol or glucagon for those growth hormone provocative test serum insulin like growth factor binding protein 3 has a greater specificity in the diagnosis of 
growth hormone deficiency. Other tests are karyotyping to detect turnus, counts, ESR, tissue transglutaminase IgA and total immunoglobulin A, anticlidine for celiac, thyroid functions test to find out hypothyroidism, sweat chloride for cystic fibrosis, serum transferrin, albumin levels for malnutrition, and imaging distal radius and cardiac renal hepatic all work up for those uh, 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 systemic disorders and for genetic sequencing this is why i said genetic sequencing is the one for shock syndrome right uh, short stature homeobox x syndromes and you can just find out those isolated gene not only shocks there are so many others which i told you earlier is so x and those uh, genes that we will be able to find out genetic sequencing and even though I talk about a lot about the short stature, my treatment is just confined to one slide, unfortunately, because it is just if there is a chronic disorder, we need to treat for the chronic disorder and hardly any that we can achieve with the linear growth. But recombinant growth hormone injections we can use, they have proven Results with the Turner, CRF, Prada, Willi, small for gestational age, shock steam deficiency, and anabolic steroids, IgA, they are also can be done, but they are still doing the research level. And certain countries, they actually tried these anabolic steroids and the IgA factors for the, to treat this growth hormone. Thank you very much.